Secondary Hemostasis, Part 1. Welcome to this Chalk Talk episode on hemostasis. You've probably sat down in front of the coagulation cascade and asked yourself, how am I going to remember all of these factors? Adding to the complexity, textbooks usually cover the details of coagulation in a laboratory setting and hardly describe the sequence in an injured blood vessel. In this Chalk Talk episode, we'll introduce you to coagulation. In the second part, we'll present the cell-based model of coagulation. So let's get started. In the previous episodes, we've learned that primary hemostasis results in the formation of a loose thrombus, also termed a platelet plug. The platelet plug is then stabilized by the coagulation cascade of secondary hemostasis. This is achieved by cross-linking the fibrin network to the platelet plug, a process driven by clotting factors. The classical coagulation cascade can proceed via two pathways that merge into a joint pathway. This division is for historical reasons. Hippocrates identified that bleeding from a wound can be rapidly stopped if the wound is covered with skin. He came to the conclusion that there must be specific factors present in tissue that stop bleeding. Then, over 2,000 years later, blood was shown to coagulate when added to a glass tube. Because coagulation appeared to be initiated without the addition of any external factors, two different pathways were defined, the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. The respective clotting factors involved were subsequently identified and placed in a sequence of reactions. This is how the cascade model was developed and was first proposed in the 1960s. It's comprised of two arms that converge to form the final common pathway. This structure has proven especially useful in understanding coagulation tests. However, for explaining the coagulation process in the body, the cascade model is less suitable. Let's look at an example. Hemophilia A is a bleeding disorder caused by deficiency in factor VIII, which plays a role in the intrinsic pathway. Because the extrinsic pathway of patients with hemophilia A is still intact, a bleeding tendency is usually not expected. However, since hemophilia is a serious condition, it becomes quickly evident that coagulation must proceed in a manner different to that of the two pathways, which are seemingly independent of one another. Therefore, we'll be presenting a new coagulation model termed the cell-based model of coagulation. It takes into account recent findings on coagulation and blood vessel injury and offers a better way of describing conditions such as hemophilia. Let's start with an overview on clotting factors. We'll be addressing several aspects that may make coagulation initially appear confusing. There are 12 factors that are especially important in coagulation. These are indicated by the Roman numerals 1 to 13. So there are 12 factors, but 13 numbers. Factor 6 later turned out to be an activated form of factor 5. As a result, there is no factor with the number 6 in use. Factor 5 is not the only factor with two different forms. Most factors have an inactive and active form. Active forms are indicated by a small a. Some factors are also identified by a common name, especially the first four factors. The term fibrin is used for factor 1 and thrombin for factor 2. Factor 3 is also known as tissue factor, and factor 4 as calcium. So, now you can see why understanding coagulation can be so complex. The topic becomes more complicated considering that some factors occur as a complex, which are also assigned other names. But don't worry, we'll take you step by step through this topic. We'll start with a closer look at the order in which the various factors participate in the coagulation cascade, which will then be followed by a comparison with the new cell-based model. The extrinsic pathway is initiated by factor 3, which forms a complex with factor 7. This complex can activate factor 10 in the common pathway. Factor 10 and its cofactor 5 can cleave factor 2, resulting in the formation of thrombin. In turn, thrombin cleaves factor 1 to fibrin, which forms fibrin strands. In addition, the extrinsic pathway can be initiated by factor 12, which is, for example, activated on negatively charged surfaces such as glass. Subsequent activation of factors 11, 9, and 8 lead to the initiation of the common pathway. The factors are now arranged in order according to the classical coagulation cascade. The first aspect that becomes evident is that this order appears quite random. This has a historical basis. The factors were numbered in accordance to the order in which they were discovered. It is only at a later stage that it became clear that the various factors interact in a different order. Putting aside this disarrangement in numbering, the principle of coagulation is actually quite clever. Most factors are proteases, and each factor activates downstream factors. The result is a gradual activation, a cascade. There are two advantages to this type of activation. 
It enables the precise control of coagulation on different levels and also a sudden increase or a chain reaction. To keep it simple, in this and the following images, we won't show the difference between inactive and active clotting factors. We hope this introduction has removed some stumbling blocks on the road to understanding this topic. So let's move on to the model of cell-based coagulation in the next Chalk Talk episode.